but let every baker be blessed and be edified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, Romans chapter 12. The first verse starts there. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Okay? So he starts with there, I beseech you, brethren. He's asking the, the brethren in Rome that they would present their bodies a living sacrifice. And then he goes on to explain what he means by that. He says, holy. And we, as we know from uh, what we talked about on Sunday, holy, something that's holy is, is different, right? It's set apart, it's sanctified, it's not like common things, okay? And he's saying you should present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And then he says, it's your reasonable service. This is not an unreasonable thing. This is not something that's extraordinarily difficult. This is just reasonable. You, you should be able to do this. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it, it speaks about this too. It says, starting in verse 15, it says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay, so in, in the letter to the Corinthians, he's talking about this too. He's saying, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so you're... You are a member of the body of Christ, and you shouldn't go and do something wicked with it or unclean. Okay, and in this case, in 1 Corinthians 6, it was about fornication. And, but that's not the only thing, okay? That's not the only thing that would keep your body from being a holy, living sacrifice unto God. That is one of the things, okay? But there's other things. What about piercings and tattoos, how about um, make, being under the influence of alcohol or drugs or fi filling your body with smoke, okay? Those are, are things that, just you think, if your body, if your body is this temple of the Holy Ghost, okay, because the Holy Ghost dwells within us, okay, do you want, do you want if you just think about it, I don't know how many of you, especially younger ones, maybe not so much because it's maybe not so prevalent among the people that you're with, but I remember a, as a, a young boy going through a room where it was just filled with smoke, right, and just try to hold your breath till you're through there, right, because there's multiple people smoking in there. And just think of that. Now, obviously, the Holy Spirit isn't, you know, His, his Spirit. It's not affected the same way, but do you think that He wants to be in a body that's just filled with smoke? Okay, or that's under the influence of alcohol, or you know, you know, we're, we're we're disrespecting that temple. We're not being a holy living sacrifice. We, we're supposed to present our bodies a living sacrifice. You know, in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice an animal, but they were, wasn't supposed to have a blemish. Okay, you didn't take the one with the broken leg, the lamb with the broken leg, or the missing eye, or something like that, and put that as a sacrifice, right? So. Just like that, we should try to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. And obviously, some people have already done things to their body that you know they regret and they can't do anything about now. But try from here on, henceforward, to present your bodies as good as you can, uh, a living sacrifice. Okay, and, and God, you know, He'll He'll take it according to what a man has and not what a man has not. Right? If you've already got a tattoo. He's, he knows that, right? He, as long as you don't go put new tattoos on, you know, he's going to see where your heart is. And let's look at verse 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay? So people, they pray for the will of God in their lives. Like, for God will show the will of God. We have, we have the will of God written down. Okay? He, he told us how He wants us to act, how He wants us to, to put, you know, present ourselves. And so we know the will of God when it comes to that. And we're not supposed to be conformed to this world. We're supposed to be holy. And, but it's not just on the outside, okay? You know, I, I'm clean cut and, and I dress well and, and I don't have tattoos or, or, you know, my body doesn't look like I fell into a tackle box, but yet your mind isn't renewed, okay? Then, then your body still isn't a proper living sacrifice if you're, your mind is not renewed, okay? Because you could put, like, like the saying is, lipstick on a pig, right? Or, or if you put paint on a vehicle that's just about to fall apart because of rust, what does that help, right? You, you, it needs to be uh, renewed from the inside. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. So we're not supposed to be conformed to this world. We know this world, you know, they, they don't care what God says about how to act and how to present your bodies. So we're not supposed to be conformed. It's so easy, right? Especially, especially if you, you get brought up in public school, right? And that is, you know, so easy for children to be influenced by the world when they're in public school and to be conformed because if you don't conform, you're going to be made fun of, right? You're going to be ridiculed and you're going to be teased. So... And obviously, the children, most of the time, they don't have a choice whether they're in public school or... And in private school, is no better. You know, it's just, you know, they pretend, or in some cases, the leadership is actually good, and they're actually trying a good thing, but you know, one bad apple spoils, you know, a whole barrel. So, we're talking this morning, or sorry, not this morning, this evening, about being, not being conformed to the world, and about our bodies as a living sacrifice. And why is that? In Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall you be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And as we'll see later, that's us in the New Testament. But he was saying to, to Israel, you know, if you will listen to me, if you will obey my voice you're, and keep the covenant, right? Then there would be a peculiar treasure. It's like people want to show off their treasure, right? And, it, it, and it's set highly on the things, that, what they esteem. And if Israel would have actually obeyed God's voice, he would, they would have been a peculiar treasure. And at certain times when they did that, they were a peculiar treasure. Okay, but when, if they didn't obey his voice, they aren't his peculiar treasure anyway. Okay, um, but the, the, this is not talking about salvation. Okay, salvation isn't keeping the law. This is after we're saved, trying to live a good life, live a clean life, and then we will be a peculiar treasure unto him above all people. That doesn't mean that we're so good, because we all still make mistakes, but we should try not to be conformed to this world, but have our mind renewed. You're there in Ephesians chapter 2. Let's look at verse 1 there. It says, And you have quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. What does that mean, quickened? That means he made you alive. You were dead in trespasses and sins, but God made you alive. You're dead, now you're alive. Okay? Something that's alive is you know, much better looking than it's dead. You know, the dead grass is all brown, right? A dead tree is all brown or gray, but a, a living one is green, okay? So we were dead in trespasses and sins, and he has quickened us. Verse 2, Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, 
and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Okay, so Paul said to the Ephesians, we all had our conversation in this, okay, in the lust of the flesh. We all fulfilled the desires of the flesh and of the mind. But he's telling them this because you used to do this, now you better do better. Okay? But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for, for, uh, sorry, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. So salvation is a gift. Not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So even though we're saved, it's a free gift, it, you know, it's nothing to do with your works, we're still ordained that we should walk in these good works, okay? We're, we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works, so that we will do the good works. We're not, when we tell people it's just through faith, through Jesus Christ, we're not saying they shouldn't do the works, but the works aren't necessary for salvation. So we, we should not be conformed to this world and try as much as possible for your body to be a living sacrifice unto God. In verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, were called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by, hand, by hands. So in the past we were Gentiles in the flesh, okay? Now we're Israel, we're a spiritual Israel. And in the times past, we were Gentiles in the flesh. Okay? Know where you come from that we were just wicked people, right? Like, and I don't, I don't mean sons of Belial, but I mean, like, everybody was, comes from sinful people. We were, we were sinners, and Christ saved us, and now we should bring glory to God by renewing our mind and, and presenting our bodies as a living side. So you're there in uh, Ephesians 2. Flip over chapter 4. While you're going there, I'm just going to read to you from 1, Peter's, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting verse 9. It says there in verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So why should we make this effort? Besides, we should be thankful to Jesus Christ for saving us. Why are we trying to live a, a you know a, a holy life? Is because we should show forth the praises of Jesus Christ. Okay, we should show forth the praises of Him that has called you and give honor and praise to God. How much praise are you giving to God? If yes, you're saved, but you're living a backslidden and wicked wicked life. How many people will want to get saved by just by looking at you? It's like, well, that's being a Christian. I don't want to be a Christian. You know, the guy's in the bar all the time, or you know, that, that guy's fornicating, whatever. You know, we our life should praise God. Okay. Now, as some falsely teach, you know, about that works will automatically come. That that doesn't happen, right? You need through the grace of God. You, you have to make an effort. Not to be confirmed to this world. If you don't make an effort, it's just like you're going downstream with everybody else. You're conformed to the, this this world, and you don't need much of an effort for that. But to to not be conformed, but rather to be renewed in your mind, that takes an effort. But that effort praises God. Okay, it brings glory to God, and that's that's what we're here for to give glory to God. That's why we're here on this earth, just to give glory to God, and we're getting other people saved so that they can give glory to God as well. Verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against these evildoers, that they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Okay? So when these Gentiles, the non-believers, they see our good works, 
they'll, they'll behold them, they'll see them, they can glorify God. Okay? And it says glorify God in the day of visitation. I mean, even the unsaved people will give glory to God, even though they're going to hell, right? They're just, they're, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ. But when, when, when these unsaved people see our good works, if we do good works, we're bringing glory to God by that, okay? And who knows, somebody might actually see, okay, this person is trying to live a, a holy and peaceable life, and, you know, his children seem to be turning away. That's what I want. That's what I want. And they might be curious about Christianity there, then, and be more willing to listen to us when we're giving the gospel. So, just because we're saved doesn't mean we just live however we want, right? As people want, you want to try to throw that in our face when we give them the gospel. So there in Ephesians 4, let's look at verse 17. The Bible says there, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now ye put on a new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Okay, so he, he's saying, you put off that old stuff, okay? You put off the old man, and again, renewed in your mind. Renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay, it starts with your mind. You've got to want to. You've got to have this, this fundamental shift in your thinking that you want to live for Christ, not just to satisfy the flesh and whatever feels good, whatever's going to get me richer, whatever is going to be fun, right? No, we want whatever pleases Christ. Our, our whole mindset has to change after we're saved so we can bring glory to God. And that, he, you know, that He's more likely to bless us, too. And that He put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for your members one of another. Okay, so it's about, not just about the outward, you know, like the, the same people can see on your body. It's also about how you act. Don't lie. Tell, tell people the truth. Okay, well, how much glory are you giving to God if you say you're a Christian and you're just lying to people all the time? You're not. Okay? Verse 20 says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So you, you can be angry and, and not sin. Obviously, that's a, a false doctrine that people um, like to uh, propagate. And you know, it keeps going on, right? Neither can place the devil, and you're not supposed to steal anymore. And, uh, you know, verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender heart, and forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Okay, let's get back to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. The Bible says, For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay? So even though these, even if you do these good works, and even if you're pretty good at doing it, don't think of yourself too highly. Don't get puffed up. Don't start thinking, oh yeah, I'm pretty good. No, those other people, they're not good. Like, don't compare yourself to other people and think you're, you're so great, okay? Compare yourself to Christ and you'll see how, how short you actually fall. And people should not think of themselves more highly than they ought, ought to think. And we know, you know, God says that pride is one of the, you know, he lists it in the seven things that he hates. He hates pride. And he talks so often in the Bible about abasing the, the people that are, are proud. And he brings them low. Because he doesn't want... The only person that can be proud is God. Right? Everybody else falls way short. What are you, what are you um, being proud of? 
Okay? In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 and 7, the Bible says, These things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. That no one of you may be puffed up for one against another. See, he's telling the people, don't even think of us too highly. Okay, because some people were, you know, well, I'm from Paul, I'm from Apollos. You know, they're, they're kind of bragging, not that straight about themselves, but I'm a follower of so-and-so, right? And he's saying, don't think of us, you know, too highly. You know, above what is written. Obviously, they're supposed to have the respect of a leader, but not, you know, above what is written. And then verse 7, I like this, this verse, it says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? As if thou hast not received it. It's like, if you got something good, don't think you're so great because you got it from God. Okay? If you're smart, you got it from God. If you're beautiful, you got it from God. Okay? If you're strong or you're fast, you got it from God. And it, just because you're better at that one thing than the next person, don't think of yourself too highly. Okay? God gave that to you just like He gave God. God gave somebody else a different gift. Okay, and just because you're fast, you might not be smart. Okay, another person that's smart might not be fast. It's don't think of yourself too highly. Verse uh, Romans twelve verse four: For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Okay, so not everybody has the same job in the church. Okay, so, but we need all the members. We, we can't, you know, we need all the pieces of the body to function. Having been gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to proportion of faith, so we, we, we all have different gifts, okay? Now, don't use this idea of gifts as an out, right? Well, I don't have, I don't have the gift of singing, so I'm not going to sing. No. Try. You maybe have to put more effort forward. And you maybe never get as good as somebody that's been doing it all your life, but try, okay? Or I don't have the gift of, you know, uh, evangelism, so I'm not going to give anybody the gospel. No, that's not it. It's just... Everybody's going to have different levels of gifts in different areas. Let's just not uh, be high-minded about it and realize that everybody's got their different gifts from God. But notice what it says there. It says, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Okay? According to the proportion of faith. And if you back up to verse 3 there, where it talks about us not thinking too highly there, at the end of the verse it says, uh, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Okay, what, what do you mean? Like, God gave you your faith? Like the Calvinists say? No. Okay, that's not... You, you gotta... Everybody's gotta decide to believe. But this, God can increase your faith. Like that man, you know, when, when Jesus said, oh, you have little faith, right? And the man said, you know, help increase my faith or help my faith I forget how he worded it God can increase our faith and God can give it to you if you ask for it um, in Luke chapter 8 um, starting in verse 16 the Bible says no man this is Jesus talking okay no man when he hath lighted a candle covereth it with a vessel or putteth it under a bed but setteth it on a candlestick that they which enter in may see the light for nothing is secret, that, thou shalt, that shall not be made manifest, not anything hid, that shall not be known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And, so, and whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. Okay? So if you're doing something with the gifts that God has given to you, you can increase your gifts. You can increase your faith. But if that little bit of faith you have, you're not doing anything with it, you're not increasing it, God can even diminish that, okay? So, take heed, therefore, how you hear, okay? To whom much is given, much is required also, okay? So, if, if you, you, you are blessed and you can grow up in church, 
Okay, realize that more is going to be required of you than in the person that, that didn't have that benefit. So, uh, Romans 12, verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophecy according to the proportion of faith. Okay? So, if God's given you great faith, don't prophecy like you got little faith. Okay? Actually, make use of the gifts that God gave you. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth, well, ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So, these, these different gifts, right? God's, you know, Paul is telling the Romans how to use those gifts, right? If your gift is ministry, you know, let us wait on our ministry. And what's ministry? It's like serving other people, right? Or if your gift is teaching, then teach. Or exhorting people, you know, that's what you should do. But then, notice, you kind of, when it comes to giving, you just do it with the simplicity. Like, don't sound a trumpet before you, don't make it too complicated, just do it sim simply, and, and not make a big deal about it. And then, he that ruleth with diligence, okay, don't be slothful in business. Um, so God gives us these different gifts. You say, well, I, I want that other gift. You know, God can still give you other gifts that you don't have. You can ask for it, right? Why don't we have things? It's because we don't ask for it. We need to ask God for gifts and, and for whatever we need. And God will give us the things we need, even if we're asking for the wrong things. Um, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about this idea of the different members. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, the Bible says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now if God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? And now are the main members yet but one body. Okay? So if in, this is talking about a human body, but you can still think like in a church, right? We're missing the eye. Everybody wants to be the eye. Nobody wants to be the ear. You can see really good, but you won't be able to hear, right? And there's different jobs in the church. Everybody just focuses on singing, and everybody should try to sing. You know, giving glory to God. But if, if just singing is all our church focuses on, where's the other parts of the body? Okay, everybody has different gifts. And that's why it's so good that there's so many different kinds of people in church that every iron sharpens iron and, and where one person lacks, the other person can be strong and, and encourage you and, and teach you and, and so on. Verse 21 in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, And I cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So this will actually tie it back into Romans 12 here in a little bit. So just because, okay, we got, let's say we've got a really good soul winner in our church, okay? It's not like he, does, he or she doesn't need anybody else. Well, I'm the greatest soul winner in the first, first place. If you have that kind of attitude, you know, what do you have? that you didn't receive, okay? That's exactly what um, the Bible here is teaching against. So, everybody's got different gifts, and we all need the, all the different people in church, and we shouldn't brag or think that we're so much greater than another person, we don't need those other people in the church. No, we need all the different members in the body of Christ. 
Verse 22, name much more these members of the body which seem to be more feeble. Oh, actually, I missed the verse here. Um, maybe not. Verse 21, the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Name much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. So you say, well, I'm not doing much in church. I'm just doing this little thing. Let's say it's somebody that's doing the cleaning or whatever. The, the feeble people are necessary, okay? And the ones that seem to be more feeble are necessary, necessary members of the body, okay? So we, we shouldn't, just like we shouldn't get too high minded, we shouldn't be too down on ourselves either. And those members, of, or especially on other people, especially. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon those we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Okay, what's comely? That's like beautiful, okay? So even your your un, your parts that are not so beautiful are very important. Let's think of your feet, okay? They're maybe not the most beautiful part of your body, but without them, you fall over, right? You need them. So that's what Paul is explaining here. He's comparing the body of Christ to your body. If you're missing one part of your body, you might still be able to function, but not very well. Okay, if you're missing one hand, well, you still get your other one, right? But how many things that you do don't need two hands? And so on. And especially the uncommonly parts, like you say, like this, for instance, your feet, you really need them. Okay, or even just your toes are gone from your feet, that can affect your balance. I've heard stories like that, okay? And how that can make walking difficult. And these members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon, these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, and hath given more abundant honor to the, that part which lacked. Whoa, okay, think about it. This could have a few different meanings. But just say, if you want to write, oh, I'm so great, and I'm so special, okay? Let's, for instance, say, you know, the face is top to the foot or whatever. Hey, I'm so beautiful and you're not or whatever, right? But notice he says, given more abundant honor to the part which lacked. Okay? So think of this to, to something in church, okay? And whatever. I, I can't think of an example. But he's saying, he's given more abundant honor to that which lacked. Okay? Sometimes what people lack in brains, they have the looks, okay? Or vice versa. They don't have the looks, so they have the brains. Okay, so God has given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. So, and you might have both, okay? But just remember, you think you're so great, you're so good looking or whatever. Well, he might have given you that more abundant honor because you, you lacked in some other places, okay? So don't, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. But, and why did he do that? Why did he give more honor to that part which lacked? He says here that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. So there's no unbalance. Okay, if one person had all the gifts and nobody else had any, there wouldn't be balance in the church. Okay, it's like if he got everything, nothing left for anybody else. Or, you know, in a physical body, you know, one person, one part of the body does everything, and everything else is just hanging there doing nothing. You know, there be, wouldn't be balance in a body. Just, just like a, a physical body wouldn't have balance, same thing with the church. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ, the members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you more excellently. So there's nothing wrong with coveting a gift, okay? I want to be better at soul winning. I want to be better singing. What do you do? Practice and you pray, okay? R read God's word, you pray, and, and you practice, okay? By exercise, right, is, is how something gets better. You, you, you just do it. Let's get back to Romans chapter 12, um, verse 9. 
Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. So remember, dissimulation, that's like fake. That's pretending. They don't have pretend love. And so he's telling, let love be without dissimulation, but he's also saying, abhor that which is evil. Hate, like detest evil, but cleave to that which is good. Verse 10, be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Okay, so what's preferring one another? It's thinking, what can I do so that the other person will get the best? Okay, let's just bring it to a really carnal example as kids, right? You always want that middle piece in the cake and let, the, let your little brother have that edge piece or vice versa, whichever one's the best one in your family, right? And no, we think of what's, what can we do for the next person so that they get the best. Okay? Instead of always trying to butt in front of the line, you let other people go first. Or, or whatever the case. Always think of the next person. Don't always think about, oh, what's best for me. Okay? Um, and I, I mean, we all do it, right? We, we go out to the go karts, we're all racing to try to get the best go kart. But we shouldn't, right? We, we should, this, and on go kart, it is, like, that part doesn't really matter. But in every part of life, you should, especially among fellow Christians, we should prefer one another. We should, even in the, in the case of a husband and a wife, we should, as husbands, we've got more authority, right? We're the head of the husband. But we should make our decisions and what's best for the family, what's best for my wife, what's best for my children, not just what's best for me. So we should prefer one another. Not slothful in business. That just means don't be lazy in your business. And that even if you don't own a business, don't be lazy in whatever you do. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. What's fervent in spirit? It's that you're not being lukewarm. You, you have a desire to serve God and you do it with passion, not just me, me, me. Like you don't really care, right? It's just blah, blah, blah. And you go to church because your parents drag you there or whatever. You, you kind of move your lips when they're singing or whatever. No, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Why are we doing these things? It's because we're serving the Lord. Even with our you know, physical job, we can serve the Lord. We're doing heartily as unto the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Okay? Continuing instant in prayer. When something goes bad for us, what, obviously we're men and we to try to fix it ourselves, but especially if it is something like major, even otherwise, be instant in prayer. Like, ask God for help. Okay? Ask God for help. Be instant in prayer. Continuing instant in prayer. Don't just, you know, go for days on end without praying to God and then something bad happens. Okay, God, I need you. Please do this, this, and this for me because I need it. No. Let's continue in prayer and let's be instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints, giving to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Okay, so somebody is down in the dumps, you know, let's say, whatever, something bad happened in their life, it's like, we're just going to be all happy and joking around with them, but we're not, you know, we're not going to be, try to bring them lower, but we'll rejoice with those that are rejoicing, be happy with them, not just, oh, I, you know, yeah, you got that good thing, but I didn't, so I don't know, you're going to be grouchy around the happy, and you're going to be happy around the grouchy, well, okay, around the grouchy, it would be a good idea to make them happy. But uh, on this, around the sad, you're just going to be joking and you're not going to be serious. No, we, we rejoice with them that you rejoice and we weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one to word another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Okay, remember we talked before about those that the parts that lack and that, you know, they might have, you know, a more important, um, in some cases, more important job with the part that, that, that lack the comeliness. Well, we should condescend to men of low estate. It's like, no, I'm too good. I'm not going to talk to that person in church because, you know, I'm, I'm whatever. I'm a lawyer. I'm not going to go talk to a plumber. I'm not going to go talk to a concrete worker. No. Or... Somebody that's like down and out and homeless or whatever, I'm, I'm too good to talk to them. No, we condescend to men of low estate. Whatever that, that, that low estate is. And, and low estate probably means in wealth, but maybe it's just in, 
in uh, happiness, right? We, we, kind of say, we will talk to people that are different than us and not be wise in our own conceits. That's so easy to do is to be conceited and think you're so smart and you know better than everybody else. You know how to fix other people's problems and you can pull that motor, you know, of their eye, but in the meantime, you got that beam in your own eye, right? Let's not be wise in our own conceits and let's, you know, consent to, condescend to men of low estate. Uh, verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest and instead of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Okay? It says, if it be possible. Some people leave that part out, right? It's not always possible. But we should not go around trying to pick a fight. Sometimes you cannot avoid a fight, okay? Um, if somebody's, you know, trying to hurt your family, you can maybe not avoid a fight. But if it's possible, as much as life in you, live peacefully with all men. Now, there, there's a story in the Old Testament that I thought of when I read this, where this guy, I mean, I think he was doing it selfishly, but he was being too peaceable with people. And that's in 1 Kings chapter 20. Yeah, you might as well turn there, 1 Kings chapter 20. We'll, we'll look at it. So, Paul is saying we should um, be renewed in our mind and we should present our bodies a living sacrifice and he tells us all these different things and, and, and how the, the body parts are all important and you know how we're supposed to bless those that persecute us and we're supposed to not curse and condescend to men of low estates and, and do all these things and then he also says if it be possible as much as life in you live peaceably with all men because why? If we're always out with a chip on our shoulder and we're ready just to fly off the handle, again, we're not bringing glory to God. Why are we supposed to present our bodies as a living sacrifice? It's to give glory to God. Why are we not supposed to be conformed to this world? It's to give God praise and honor and glory. Okay? Why are we supposed to be holy? It's to give God the glory. So, if it is possible, we should live peaceably. Uh, with all men, but it's not all, always possible. Just remember that. First Kings 20, verse 1. And Ben Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together. And there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. And he sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben Hadad, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. Okay, so here it is, Ben Hadad, he's you know, up against the city, he besieged Samaria. So it sounds like he surrounded them, he's not letting anybody come in or out with you know, food or, or water or anything like that. And he's saying, You gotta give me your silver, you gotta give me your gold, you gotta give me your wives and your children. That doesn't sound unreasonable. Now, if somebody's has you surrounded like that, you might give them all your silver and your gold, but your wives and your children, forget it, right? If you're, you know, a regular person. So in this case, it's, you, it's not possible to live peaceably with this person, right? You might not have no choice. You might lose, but go out in a fight, right? So, but that's not what Ahab does. Ahab says, verse 4 there, And the king of Israel answered and said, My lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine, and all that I have. It's like, What? Who in the right mind would do that, right? It's like, well, you say, well, he, he was just very scared, and, and that's that's why um, why he gave in, right? Well, yeah, maybe he was scared, but we'll look at verse five, and we'll see that's you know that's not his whole idea here. And the messengers came again and said, "Thus speaketh Ben Hadad, saying, Although I have sent unto thee, saying." Thou shalt deliver me thy silver and thy gold and thy wives and thy children. Yet I will send my servants unto thee tomorrow about this time, and they shall search thine house and the houses of thy servants, and it shall be that whatsoever is pleasant in thine eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. So even though he agreed to his outlandish request of all his gold, all his silver, and his wives and his children, he agreed to that ridiculous request. Oh, well, I know I said that, but now... We're going to come and see what else we want. Okay? 
Verse 7, Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Mark, I pray you, and see how this man seeketh mischief. And he sent unto me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I denied him not. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, Hearken not unto him, nor consent. So, he was okay with the first request, but the second one he didn't want to do. So if it was just a matter of him being scared, why didn't he submit to this request also? He already gave them their wives and their children, or he was willing to do it. But no, it's like, as long as I, you know, I'm okay, you know, I'm still going to hold some wealth, or whatever his reasoning was. But that, that's being too peaceable with people. Once, once they want to hurt your family, no. Okay? And there's and this can apply to us today too, because think of those implacable people, the sodomites, right? Well, all they want to do is, is get married to each other. They just want to, because they love each other, whatever, right? But then they give them that, and then they want to adopt children, and, and so on, and it just keeps on going, right? As a man, you got to be able to stand up at important times, okay? I mean, and you don't, we got to... As much as life in us, we should live peaceably with all men. So there comes a point where they want to force vaccinate all your children. That no, we're not going to allow that, right? And well, if we've got to wear masks in Walmart, we don't want to do it. But if we have to, we can do it. But when it comes to something where we've got to draw the line, somebody wants to hurt our families, then we've got to stop and say, no, it's not possible for me to live peaceably with you. I'm going to resist. And, and Ben, he didn't draw that line at the right spot. Okay, if you would have said, "Yeah, you're, you can have the gold and silver, but I want to keep my," you know, he could have done that, right? He could send back and negotiate. Yeah, you can have all the gold and silver. I can throw a few gemstones in there, but I want my wives and I want my children. But no, he didn't even try to negotiate with them. Now, so as much as possible. Let's get back to Romans 12. We're almost done here. Romans 12, verse 19, the Bible says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Okay, so God's telling us, through Paul here, he says, not to avenge ourselves. If somebody does something bad to us, do we have to get him back and make things even? Guess what? God is going to repay. It says here, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will replay, saith the Lord. What if you have a young child, let's say four years old, and somebody hurts them, okay? Is, do you think it's a good idea if that four-year-old gets them back? Or if the, the dad gets them back, okay? Do you, do you think the dad won't have a much more appropriate punishment? And think of it this way. If we try to get somebody back that, that hurts us, isn't it much, God knows much better what's the, the more appropriate punishment, and he's, he's in a position to do it. It's much better that we can take it and let God deal with it. Vengeance is his, okay? It's like, if somebody hurts my children, okay, I'm going to deal with it. You're, you're not going to get away with that, right? And God's the same way. He, he, loves, he loves us as children, and he's going to take care of it. That's, he wants that. You, you it's not up to you. I'm going to take care of it. God's saying, right? Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And just think of that four-year-old. What's he going to do? Okay, let's say some man goes and just slaps a kid or whatever. Okay? It's like the kid's going to slap him back and the, other, the, the man's going to laugh at him. But if a full-grown man comes and, you know, whatever is appropriate, right? Um, but God is infinitely wise and he's also infinitely powerful, and he can, he can let the punishment fit the crime, and just you know, tell it to Jesus, let him take care of it, he's going to do a much better job of it, and if we have this attitude of always trying to get everybody back, it's just going to drag you down. Just leave it, let God deal with it, he's going to do a much better job. Verse 20, we're almost done here. Romans 12, verse 20, the Bible says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So he's teaching here, instead of, you know, 
doing evil to the person that did you evil, rather do good to them, right? So if your enemy hungers, you know, give him food. If he's thirsty, give him drink. Because you're actually, are you actually physically heaping coals of fire in their head? No, you're not. But you're making them feel really stupid, and and you know they're they're gonna feel really bad about it. And just imagine this: if, if you mistreated somebody and then they're nice to you, how how would that make you feel? It would make you feel pretty sheepish, right? Pretty lousy. And that's the way we should treat our enemies. And God's gonna God's gonna avenge, right? And who knows, the, the, the enemy might repent of what they did, and, and you guys can be friends again, or whatever. But notice it says, if thine enemy hunger. It doesn't say, if your children's enemy. It doesn't say, if God's enemy. It just says, if thine enemy hunger. Okay, feed him. God's enemy, we're not, we're not going to hunger. Or we're not going to feed them, or, or uh, give them drink. And by that I mean like a reprobate. We're not. We're not going to feed them. We're not going to. Um, and these people, it, you know, it, it annoys me how people have this this attitude to just love everybody. No, love your enemies, but don't love God's enemies. Okay. If your enemy hungers, give him food, give him drink. If God's enemy hungers, hopefully he dies and goes to hell. Right. Um, so, but. Other than that, as much as possible, live peaceably with all men, and um, you know, overcome evil with good. So I think Paul gives us a, a many things here how we can uh, have our mind renewed and live a, a better life, and how we can give glory to God, and so we can present our bodies, a, you know, a living sacrifice that's holy, but it's. Again, it's not just our outside of our body, it's our inside, it's our, it starts with our mind. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for uh, Romans chapter 12, and uh, thank you for salvation. Help us to do the works to bring honor and glory to you, and uh, help us not just think that because we have salvation, we can just coast and slide, um, but help us to do the works, and help us be renewed in our mind, and help us treat people the way you want us to, and and help us realize that, that whatever we have, uh, that we have, we receive from you, and that we shouldn't think of ourselves too highly, um, you know, and not be puffed up. Rather, to stay humble and to treat people the way you want us to treat them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right.